Tonight, battered by rainfall, Indonesian rescuers search for missing in buried cars and buses after landslide and rain wreck havoc in Sumatra. A deal breaker. On second day of truce, Israel and Lebanon trade accusations of ceasefire violations. A daring move. Tech companies put on notice as Australia passes world's first social media ban for under 16s. And best friend turns 40. North America's oldest macaroni penguin marks the humongous fourth decade of its lifespan. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here with the final bulletin for this week, bringing you key stories across the globe for this Friday and we begin today in Indonesia. At least 31 people were killed after a week of torrential rains triggered flash floods and landslides across Indonesia's North Sumatra province. The disaster has affected four districts from Medan to rural areas where the landslides have severed access for communities with roads buried under debris. Indonesian authorities said the number of casualties may rise as tourist locations have also been hit. The country's National Disaster Agency said Thursday that torrential rain since last week destroyed houses and farms in mountainous regions, many of which remain covered in mud and fallen trees. Authorities also said some vehicles remain trapped on roads around the region's largest city of Medan, where bodies from a tourist bus were recovered earlier. Local elections were also affected with floods closing some polling stations in the city. Over in South Korea, the historic snowfall in the past two days resulted in six deaths and a number of injuries. It also resulted in a great deal of facility damage in the South Korean capital of Seoul. Wednesday and Thursday saw the most November snowfall seen in the greater Seoul area in over a hundred years. The heavy snowfall also resulted in the deaths of six people. The fatalities include a person who died late Wednesday at a golf range in Pyeongtaek, Gyeonggi-do province after a net covered in heavy snow collapsed. Also in Gyeonggi-do, a man was killed when a protective tent at an auto parts factory collapsed due to the sheer weight of the piled up snow, while a man in his 60s out clearing snow was killed when the immense weight of accumulated snow brought a tree down on him. Two people were killed in traffic accidents, while a civil servant died from cardiac arrest after clearing snow. Combined with the wet snow that fell, the tremendous weight and pressure on roofs and structures caused a great deal of damage. Experts say 50 centimeters of wet snow piled up on a 100 square meter area would weigh 5 tons. This led to many older facilities and roofs to collapse, with several injuries reported over the past two days. Such was the case in Anyang, Gyeonggi-do province, where the roof of an agricultural and marine products wholesale market collapsed on Thursday. A woman in her 60s was injured due to the incident. The unprecedented snow has also impacted travel throughout the country. Dozens of flights were cancelled during the two-day period, with many more delayed. Many commuters also found themselves without access to public transportation in some parts of Seoul, as buses struggled to access snow-covered roads. Extra caution is advised on Friday with sub-zero temperatures causing icy roads. Also with snow forecast for Friday afternoon, the country is preparing to minimize damage seen during the past two days. China's Defense Minister Dong Jun is under investigation as part of a wide anti-corruption probe affecting the People's Liberation Army. Dong is the third consecutive Chinese Defense Minister to face corruption investigations. Media reports say Dong is under investigation in a major anti-corruption effort in the People's Liberation Army. One U.S. official, speaking anonymously, said China's investigation into its rocket forces had spread to the military and procurement more generally. The official added that the investigation into Dong is important because Chinese President Xi Jinping appointed him. Dong would be the third consecutive Chinese defense minister to be investigated for alleged corruption. When asked, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson called the reports of a probe chasing shadows. China's military has conducted an anti-corruption purge since last year, removing at least nine generals and several defense industry leaders. 
Dong, a former PLA Navy chief, was appointed defense minister in December 2023 and handles China's military relations with other countries. He oversaw a recent improvement in US-China military ties, with both nations holding their first commander-level talks in September. But he since appears to have been passed over for promotion to the Central Military Commission, the country's top military body. His two predecessors were expelled from the Communist Party in June for serious violations of discipline, a term that Beijing often uses as a euphemism for corruption. The U.S. is monitoring military cooperation between Russia and China in the resource-rich Arctic. The Arctic's significance as a geopolitical hotspot has increased due to the convergence of two other factors, climate change and the strategic importance. The U.S. closely monitoring growing military cooperation between Russia and China in the resource-rich Arctic. Russian and Chinese warships stepping up operations in recent weeks. And bombers from both countries seen patrolling the skies near Alaska in July for the first time. The Arctic now a new point of tensions as the U.S., Russia and China see new opportunities in a region where rising temperatures have caused the polar ice sheet to recede, opening up new sea lanes and shipping routes. We traveled to Alaska, where U.S. special operation teams are preparing for any conflict in the region. We follow them to the closest point to Russia on the American mainland. This is Polar Dagger, a mission intended to show Russia's decision makers what the U.S. military can do in the remote areas of the Arctic. But the goal is to keep the Arctic stable and prevent the risk of miscalculation with Russia and China as they increase their operations in the region. Colonel Matthew Tucker says the military's ability to operate here shouldn't be taken as a threat. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. To the White House tonight, President-elect Donald Trump took a step forward on stopping illegal immigration through Mexico. Mexican President Claudia Scheinbaum suggested, however, Mexico was already doing its part and had no interest in closing its borders. The two spoke just days after Trump threatened to impose sweeping new tariffs on Canada and Mexico as part of his effort to crack down on illegal immigration and drugs. A phone call between two of North America's most powerful figures as U.S. President-elect Donald Trump talked to Mexican Premier Claudia Scheinbaum for the very first time on Wednesday. It's a call that both sides described as positive, despite having differing views on what actually transpired. Trump was quick to post on Truth Social, claiming that his counterpart had effectively agreed to close the southern border and stop migrants coming through Mexico into the United States. Scheinbaum posted a response in order to distance herself from that claim, saying that she'd explained her country's comprehensive strategy on migration. The positive nature of the call will come as a relief to many. It comes just days after Trump said that he'd impose a 25% tariff on all goods from the country unless Mexican authorities stop migrants and drugs, especially fentanyl, from coming across the border. In the first nine months of the year, the United States had imported $378 billion in goods from Mexico. In terms of migration, arrivals at the US-Mexico border have dropped 40% from an all-time high in December, a drop which has been credited to increased Mexican vigilance, driven by mounting pressure from the Biden administration. Meanwhile, the U.S. President Joe Biden expressed hopes that President-elect Donald Trump would reconsider his plans to impose tariffs on Mexico and Canada, stressing that it would ruin relations with the neighboring countries. Speaking to reporters, Biden called Trump's proposed tariff plans counterproductive, saying that the last thing the U.S. needs is to screw up relations with its two allies. The comments come as Trump announced that he would implement 25 percent tariffs on Canada and Mexico. 
According to data from the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, Mexico and Canada are the second and third highest suppliers of goods to the U.S., while China, which would also be impacted by Trump's proposed plan, imports the most to the U.S. Well, updating you now on the war in Gaza, Israel's military and Lebanon's army are trading accusations that each country violated the ceasefire agreement between Israel and the Iran-backed militant group Hezbollah in Lebanon. It comes less than two days after the deal was first reached and went into effect. Day two of the Israeli Hezbollah ceasefire and in northern Israel, work is starting on repairing rocket damage from the war. In Kiryat Shimona, a few miles from the border with Lebanon, the scars of conflict are still visible. And the sounds of battle still audible. Our camera caught outgoing Israeli artillery fire towards southern Lebanon. The IDF saying it bombed a Hezbollah rocket facility. Both Hezbollah and the Lebanese army accused the IDF of violating the ceasefire. In the southern suburbs of Beirut, Matt Bradley met residents coming back to massive destruction. A very different picture across the border. We follow Limur Ben Avi, who briefly returned to her home to collect items for her twins. Beyond these hills, Lebanon. And the lingering question on everyone's mind, can this truce hold? Australia approved a social media ban for children aged under 16 after an emotive debate that has gripped the nation, setting a benchmark for jurisdictions around the world with one of the toughest regulations targeting big tech. Social media will soon be banned for under 16-year-olds in Australia after a new law sets a benchmark with one of the world's toughest regulations targeting big tech. It forces tech giants from Instagram and Facebook owner Meta to TikTok to stop minors logging in or face fines of up to $32 million. Parliamentary inquiry this year heard evidence from parents of children who self-harmed due to social media bullying. Domestic media backed the ban, led by Rupert Murdoch's News Corp. I'll quickly pull it up. 16-year-old user Eni Lam acknowledges its potential harm but says it is deeply ingrained in society and the law will force young people to more dangerous parts of the internet. The ban also faced opposition from privacy advocates and some child rights groups, but 77% of the population wanted it, according to latest polls. Speaking on behalf of social media platforms, Australia's Digital Industry Group Managing Director Sunita Bose said the bill was rushed through Parliament. In submissions, Google and Meta said the ban should be delayed until an age verification trial finishes, expected in mid-2025. The country will be watched as a test case, as a growing number of governments look to implement similar legislation. Today I can announce that... The ban, considered a political win for Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, could strain Australia's relationship with key ally the United States. Come here. Ex-owner Elon Musk, a central figure in President-elect Donald Trump's administration, said in a post this month it seemed a backdoor way to control access to the internet by all Australians. Australia has also made social media platforms pay media outlets royalties for sharing their content and now plans to threaten them with fines for failing to stamp out scams. Police clashed with protesters in the Georgian capital Tbilisi after the country's ruling party said that the government would suspend talks on European Union accession and refuse budgetary grants until 2028. Police clashed with pro-European Union protesters in the Georgian capital Tbilisi early on Friday. Demonstrations broke out overnight after the country's ruling party said Thursday it would suspend talks on joining the EU until 2028. Police ordered protesters to disperse, fired water cannons, and deployed pepper spray and tear gas as massed young people tried to smash their way into the parliament. Some protesters tossed fireworks at police while shouting Russians and slaves. Local media reported that protests erupted in several provincial cities as well. The country's figurehead president accused the government of declaring war on its own people. He asked riot police whether they serve Georgia or neighboring Russia. Georgia has long been among the most pro-Western of the former Soviet states. Opinion polls show that around 80% of citizens support EU membership, and the aim of EU accession is written into the country's constitution. The bloc's flag flies alongside the national flag outside virtually all government buildings. 
However, Georgia's relations with the EU have deteriorated sharply in recent months, with Brussels alleging that the Georgian Dream governing bloc had adopted pro-Russian stands and pushed through bills that critics have called authoritarian, including curbs on LGBT rights and so-called foreign agents. Those moves led the EU to suspend Georgia's application for membership. Georgia Dream denies that it is pro-Russian and says it is committed to democracy and integration with the West. The party says it still wants to join the EU eventually, though it has, in recent years, deepened ties with Russia. Romania's top court ordered a recount of votes in the first round of the presidential election and the country's top security body warned Romania was a key target for hostile actions from Russia after a shock result in the ballot. Independent far-right politician Kalin Georgescu polled in single digits before Sunday's vote, but surged to a victory that has raised questions over how the surprise was possible. The Constitutional Court's decision adds to the turmoil surrounding the electoral process in Romania, which is set to hold three ballots in as many weeks, votes that are crucial to the direction of the country. Romania's top security body, the Supreme Defense Council, also warned the country was a key target for hostile actions from Russia and that it had evidence of cyber attacks meant to influence the electoral process. There was no immediate comment from Russian authorities, and Moscow has previously denied foreign election interference. The council said in a statement that, quote, a presidential candidate benefited from massive exposure through preferential treatment on TikTok. Georgescu gained many votes from young voters and Romanians living abroad. His campaign relied heavily on TikTok. A spokesperson for TikTok said it was, quote, categorically false to claim Georgescu's account was treated differently to any other candidate. Georgescu said in a statement that state institutions were trying to deny people's vote and earlier in the week said he has no connections to Russia. He's due to face centrist contender Elena Lasconi in a runoff on December 8th. On social media, Lasconi said the court was, quote, interfering in the democratic process for the second time, referring to a previous court decision to ban a far-right politician from running in the election. By law, the top court needs to validate the first round result by November 29th for the runoff vote to happen as scheduled. But the head of the country's election authority said recounting over 9.4 million votes would take days. Bernard Arnault, Europe's richest man, denies involvement in an elite scheme to spy on a French MP. As he testified in the trial of a former French spy chief, Arnault denied any knowledge of illegal surveillance ordered by a trusted associate almost a decade ago. And said he didn't know about allegedly illegal surveillance ordered by a trusted associate almost a decade ago. Scaccini headed France's counterintelligence services from 2008 to 2012 and was later hired by LVMH as a security consultant. During that time, he allegedly illegally collected information on private individuals and violated privacy laws while helping the company fight counterfeits. He's also accused of monitoring left-wing activists planning to target the company with protests. The case casts a light on the lengths to which the world's biggest luxury group has allegedly gone to to protect its image. Scaccini's lawyers did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Arnaud is not accused of any wrongdoing in the trial. A $10 million settlement in 2021 closed a criminal probe into LVMH's role in the case. However, the two-week trial has thrust the billionaire into the spotlight at a time when his luxury empire is already navigating a downturn. Chocolate prices are on the rise this holiday season as climate change is threatening the cocoa harvest in West Africa, the largest region for cocoa production in the world. Daniel Aponsa comes from a long line of cocoa farmers, but in recent years, the 66-year-old says cultivating the crop is getting harder. Ghana is the world's second largest cocoa producer. Here, farmers say erratic rain is leading to crop rot and rampant deforestation is causing dramatic water loss in the soil. Experts say changing weather patterns continue to have a negative impact on the cocoa supply. The price of cocoa has more than doubled since the start of 2024. For consumers, buying chocolate in the U.S. will likely be more expensive this year. 
to adapt, farmers like Daniel and Ataifsi are teaming up with nonprofit Fair Trade to learn new climate forward ways to farm, like using fruit bearing trees to provide moisture and shade to the cocoa crop from excessive heat. Ifsi sharing that training with other farmers in her community. Today, experts are hopeful a better fall weather forecast and sustainable farming practices will help the cocoa supply rebound this season. While Aponsa credits Coco and the new farming techniques for his livelihood, he believes more must be done to mitigate climate change. A short commercial break now, more world news on the other side. Welcome back. World News Tonight gives thanks to the quiet heroes this Thanksgiving as more and more are joining hands to deliver kindness to those in need. Tonight on this Thanksgiving, the incredible acts of kindness across our country. From right here in New York City, the glove factory, Wing and Weft Gloves. The team hard at work sewing toiletry kits that they're donating to homeless shelters. Southwest Airlines donating the seat covers from decommissioned planes. The seamstresses turning the seats into toiletry kits. In Gloucester, Massachusetts, Gordon's Seafood since 1849. 500 workers. This year, for their 175th anniversary, they're encouraging their team and loyal customers to perform 175 acts of joy. Jody Blanche is donating food. She's worked at Gorton's for 34 years. Larry Ireland is donating too. And with so many traveling this holiday season, United Airlines pilot Scott Wardle personally ordering and serving dozens of pizzas to 155 passengers on his flight. Flying from Houston to Phoenix, he had to make an emergency landing in Albuquerque for a sick passenger. The passenger, thankfully, would be okay. But the cabin crew timed out and the passengers had to wait for new flight attendants. With the food court about to close, Captain Scott sprung into action. And finally tonight, a penguin celebrated his 40th birthday at SeaWorld San Diego. It's a milestone less than 1% of penguins live to see. Say hello to Best Friend. That's his name, Best Friend. Yeah, that's a good papa. He's a macaroni penguin at SeaWorld San Diego. Hi! And it's safe oh, to say so Katie funny. Belnick is Best Friend's hello. best friend. As people watch from the penguin encounter's moving walkway, <laughs> best friend is living his best life. No one better than Katie. Oh my love. A zoological specialist for birds. Yeah, best friend is 40. Hatched here in San Diego in 1984. The average macaroni penguin is lucky to live 15 years in the wild, 30 with experts like his BFF babying you. All about the 300 penguins in the encounter, like this guy, who are apparently very interested in strangers with GoPros. These birds are definitely sassy at times, but there is also a little respect for best friend. Sometimes, as far as longevity goes, he's rare. Fewer than 1% of penguins reach this age, a milestone Katie hopes to duplicate and exceed with all her little friends. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We'll be back on Monday with the latest updates from across the world. Stay tuned as we've got Anuradhi Vikram Singh joining you next on the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching and have a great weekend.